open it to us. Would you please help us to come, Lord, with eyes that can understand and minds that can understand and hearts that can understand. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to see you. I pray that you'd help us to understand more of who you are and your, your absolute perfection. I pray that you would also help us to be, well, brutally honest with ourselves. And God, I pray that we would not try to gloss over things. I pray that we would not try to make excuses. I pray that we would look at your word, we would understand it, and that, God, we would be changed because of it. I pray so much for the empowerment of your spirit upon all of us to not only understand, but truly to live out your word today. And may all of this, yes, all of this be truly all for Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> As we continue our journey through the major doctrines of our faith, today we are going to study sin. <laughs> and let's be honest, it, it's a dark depressing subject. I don't think it's anything that we want to talk about necessarily. It's not like, who sin? woo I am so glad I came today. Right? None of us are thinking that. Um, in fact, some of you might be like, oh man, I knew I should have stayed home and I had that second cup of coffee instead of getting around coming to church today. But I hope that in spite of the fact that this is a dark subject, I hope that it is something that you and I can really let Scripture reveal to us the truth of, and I hope it is not anything that we try to ignore or pretend doesn't really happen. You see, in, in our PC world, our political correctness, and we're so careful with everything that we say, I would say to you that in this, this world that we live now, this, it's a three-letter word, sin, it's a three-letter word that really doesn't seem to exist anymore. I mean, we... To call something sin, it is like so 20th century, right? Because we just don't do that anymore. It's, it, whether we're Christians or, or non-Christians, I think that we all tend to do this. We, we have ways that we try to justify our actions. And, and we do that partly by, by kind of softening the language of what we do. And so rather than call it sin, what, as the Bible does, we might simply call it a mistake. You know, it was, it was an error. It was, it was a poor choice. Uh, it was a lapse in judgment. What was I thinking? Or maybe we call it even just a normal response. I mean, after all, nobody's perfect. Bo boys will be boys. Girls will be girls. Right? That's kind of the attitude. Today, what I do not want us to look at sin from a cultural perspective. I want us to see it for what the Bible says it to be. And I'm hoping and praying so much that what we talk about today is truly a biblical perspective on this. And I think we're all pretty familiar with sin, aren't we? Um, it's, you know, I couldn't help but smile. One pastor, he was preaching on sin and after the service he was kind of surprised someone came up to him from the congregation and they they were kind of like a little bit panicked and he's like pastor pastor says aren't you a little bit nervous about preaching on the subject of sin knowing that you're you have a congregation full of experts on sin and <laughs> you know I, I, I'm here to tell you this I don't know I don't even pretend to know how whether you guys are experts on sin or not but I am sorry to say that I know that I am. And so, whether this message applies to you, I suspect it will, but whether it applies to you or not, I'm going to leave that between you and the Holy Spirit. But I guarantee that this is a message that speaks to me. You see, a few weeks ago, we studied the doctrine of man, and, and when we were doing that, we talked about the fact that we were all created in the image of God. Hopefully that's somewhat familiar to you guys. We talked about that, and we said that being made in the image of God means that we are to image him. And we, we said that what that really means, in other words, is it means we are to represent him. We are to reflect him to the world around us, and thereby, when we do that, we are to bring glory to him. That is part of what it means. We looked at Genesis 1, where we are made in 
the image of God. The problem, though, that we all face, that we all struggle with is us being image bearers is that every single one of us are also sinful. And we are sinners not only by action and deed, but we are also sinners by our very nature. Because you see, when Adam sinned, we looked at this a few weeks ago, Adam sinned in Genesis chapter 3, he was our head. He was, in other words, our representative. And so when he sinned, he plunged all of humanity into the dark, formidable, unrelenting sea of sin. We are all sinful by the fact that we are human because we have the sinful nature that Adam passed on to us. So, I want to really start out here by, by defining sin. I think we all have some good ideas, of course, about what that is, but in his systematic, excuse me, in his book entitled Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem, he gives a very succinct, but I would say a very great definition of sin. Sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. Sin can be wrong things that we do, and I think that that's what we tend to think about a lot with sin. It's like, oh yeah, this thing I did, I know that that was against God's will, I know that God didn't want me to do it, that is sin. Yes, that is indeed sin. Wrong action is. 1 John 3, 4 says this, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. It is doing wrong things. Things that are against God's moral law. We can also sin, though, and I think we don't think about this as often, but we can also sin by neglecting to do good things that we should do. Turn to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. This is a great verse. I have no doubt that many of you could quote this, but I want to point this out here. James chapter 4. James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, wrote this his letter here is a very practical book. And in chapter 4, verse 17, look at that with me, please. James 4, 17. So, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is, what's that word? Sin. Sin. Knowing the right thing, but failing to do it, for him it is sin. Now, now, some refer to the first one we talked about, the, the wrongful deeds or the wrongful actions. Some refer to those as sins of commission. And then the failure to do good things, they call sins of omission. That that's, reminds me of the story. There's a Sunday school teacher, and she was trying to explain to her young class, her class of children, about what sin was. And so she had talked about this, and she said, okay, then I want you guys... Tell me, what, what's the sin of omission? Absolute silence. You could see the perplexed looks on their young faces. And finally, a brave young man tentatively raised his hand and he said, I, I, think, I think those are sins that we should have committed, but we didn't. <laughs> No. <laughs> nice try, but no. Okay. <laughs> Failure to do the right thing is a sin. Scripture uses many synonyms for, for sin, though. And whether, you know, commission, omission, I just really want to zero in on sin itself here. And like I said, Scripture uses many synonyms for that word. It, it can be called wickedness or transgressions, iniquity, rebellion, ungodliness, unrighteousness, unbelief, and, and there's many other things too. But I tell you this, obviously, the Bible does not soft-pedal sin. It does not. It does not water it down. It doesn't try to make it so it's not so difficult to hear. It doesn't make it so more, much more palatable the Bible is very clear on what sin is. Sin literally means missing the mark of God's standards and law. So hear me clearly on this. Any failure to conform to God's moral law is sin. So we talked about, again, as I mentioned earlier, whether that's an act or whether that's in your attitude or whether that's your sinful nature, any failure, Thing that does not conform to God's moral law is sin. 
I think that we understand that, right? We understand pretty much what sin is. What I want to do today, I want to do it again next week as well. So I'm warning you, <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk more about sin next week. Don't, when you leave today, don't think, whew, I'm so glad we're done with that. Um, yeah, return next week. And I actually think next week is going to be even more, considerably more informational than this week on it. But what I want to do is I want to ask questions and I want to then deal with the question, a series of them. So I have two of them that I want us to deal with here today. So first of all, how much does sin affect us? <laughs> the answer, completely and totally. Yeah. Aren't you glad you came today? Right? You, weren't, you were feeling a little bit down, a little bit discouraged, and you knew, though, boy, if I go to church, I am going to be lifted up. I am going to be feeling good. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe not. But I am so glad you asked. What, how much does sin affect us? Thank you for asking that. Oh, wait. <laughs> I asked that. What was I thinking? I asked, that, didn't I? So, but I think that this is important to understand that it's, sin is a part of your being. It really is. It's a part of your nature. And therefore, your entire life is affected by sin. Okay, how many of you have heard this phrase, uh, total depravity? Can I see hands? Total depravity. Okay, that was pretty good. Maybe three-fourths of you. I was hoping for 100%. That means I need to do a better job preaching on sin. So, did I mention come back next week? I, I, yeah. But total depravity. Doesn't that sound dire? I mean, total depravity? I mean, that just sounds so ominous, so dreadful. But it's true of us. You see, we are born into sin, and therefore we, we are born with a sin nature. When Adam sinned as our representative, all humankind since then has a sinful nature. And we are born into that. And that means we are totally prey. But, I, but while we might be familiar with the phrase, and maybe we've heard it, I want to try to be a little bit more clear on what it really means, this idea of this. Because I'm not sure that we always get that. So, it does not mean, all right, I know you probably should never define words by saying what it doesn't, but I think it's important to understand. It does not mean that we are incapable of doing anything good. Forget that idea. It's like, oh yeah, totally depraved. Yeah, I guess that they can't do anything good. No, that's not what it means. Neither does it mean that we are necessarily as bad as we possibly could be. So does that make sense? We're not, as, we're not saying we're as bad as we could be. We're not saying that we can't do anything good. I mean, anyone can do good deeds, good actions. So that's not what total depravity means. Total depravity does mean that every part of our being is affected by sin. That's our intellect, our emotions and desires, our goals and motives, and even our physical bodies. Therefore, we are utterly and completely incapable of doing any spiritual good in terms of our relationship with God. That's what total depravity means. I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We cannot do anything spiritually good in regards to our relationship with God ex unless we have accepted Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And the reason for that is because we all are totally depraved. That's part of being human because we are born with that sin nature. Romans chapter 8, I want you to go down to verse 7 with me, please. Let me read a couple verses to you here. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Look at this in verse 8. Those who are in the flesh. In other words, what that means is those who are not in Christ, i.e., those who are not Christians, all right? Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Do you understand? That is why it is so futile for people to think that maybe I can be just a little bit better, maybe I can just be a little, do things a little bit better than before, and I can somehow earn my way into God's favor. It can't happen. It's impossible to do. Those who are not in Christ cannot please God. Now again, that doesn't mean they can't do good things. 
But I'm telling you, in regards to your spiritual relationship with God, you can do nothing to earn any part of your salvation. Don't think that you have to get your life better. I have to improve in some areas, and then, then I will be able to finally get right with God. It won't happen that way. It cannot happen that way. Because those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's what it means that we are totally depraved. Now, we have not lost the privilege of being made in the image of God, what we talked about a few weeks ago. We are still his image bearers, and I'm talking all of humanity is, all of mankind is, but understand this, the image of God within us has been severely damaged and distorted because total depravity makes it completely impossible for us to do anything good to earn God's favor in any way. That is why we are all in desperate need of a Savior. Desperate need of a Savior. And after we get done with sin for a couple weeks here, we are going to look at salvation. But I want you to understand clearly, because of total depravity, because of the fact that you were born with a sin nature, because of the fact that you can do nothing spiritually good to please God on your own, because of that, there is only one way for salvation. Only one. And we do not need to apologize. We do not need to compromise. We do not need to water it down. We don't not need to say it in a way that just seems a little more pleasant to people. Jesus Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. Amen. The only way. Sin requires a Savior. And I'm telling you what, you might have the best intentions in the world, but you will never be good enough because you're depraved. You're not only depraved, you're totally depraved. Now, don't go to friends this week and say, hey, <laughs> I went to church Sunday. Guess what? You are totally depraved. Okay. <laughs> I don't really think that that's a great way to relate to your friends, but it's tr it is true nonetheless. <laughs> okay, second question that I want to address today is this. Since we are all born with a sinful nature, I mean, we really don't have a choice. We're born into it, right? Since we are all born with a sinful nature, why does God make such a big deal about our sins? And I'll tell you why. Because sin is a really big deal. While we might try to soften it a little bit or present it in ways, again, that are less harsh, I'm telling you, God cannot do that. God cannot. Sin is contrary to everything that God is. Everything that God is. Let me quote from Wayne Gruden again in the same book, Systematic Theology. He says, Sin is directly opposite to all that is good in the character of God. And so God necessarily and eternally hates sin. It is, in essence, the contradiction of the excellence of his moral character. It contradicts his holiness. And he must hate it. Oh, oh, for us to see sin in the way that God sees it. T -t to see it for what it really is. It is insolent, willful, disobedient rebellion against God. Oh, for us to hate sin the way that God hates it. I think if we did, we would live our lives differently. But sadly, we don't really do that. We don't. Oh, don't get me wrong. We, we hate some sins. We hate the really bad sins that we see on the news that are so horrific and despicable they almost want to make you vomit. We hate those sins, and well, we should. And we also are pretty good at hating most of the sins that other people commit. <laughs> In fact, we're, we're kind of really good at pointing out sins of other people. But we kind of give ourselves a free pass. Or maybe it's not really a free pass, because I know we know that we know we can't really do that. We know we are sinful. So what we do is we kind of downplay the seriousness of what we do. I'll tell you, God hates sin. That is why he makes such a big deal about sin. Because it's contrary to who he is. A second reason that God makes such a big deal about sin is because of the serious consequences of what sin brings. 
Do you remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23? He writes this. He says, for the wages, for the wages of sin is what? <coughs> death. Very good. The wages of sin is death. Sin is a life and death matter. Not only physically. We understand our bodies are aging and they hurt and we understand that. But it is also death spiritually and eternally because sin can cause us to be forever separated from our creator God. And indeed, it does that very thing to all who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because again, Jesus is the only means of salvation, the only possible way of salvation. And so when we tend to think that sin is not that big of a deal, we are lying to ourselves. In fact, Robert G. Lee, not to be confused with Robert E. Lee, Civil War fame, okay, this is much more recent. Robert G. Lee, he wrote a book entitled Heart to Heart, published in 1977. He wrote, he wrote this. Sin has ruined men, ruined women, ruined angels. Sin has occasioned every tear of sorrow, every sigh of grief, every pang of agony. Sin has, a, has withered everything that is fair, blasted everything that is good, made bitter everything that is sweet, dried up springs of comfort, rolled far and wide tides of sorrow. Sin has digged every grave, built every coffin, woven every shroud, enlarged every cemetery that the world has ever seen. Sin is a really big deal. And that's why God makes such a big deal of our sin. The sad truth, though, is that just as Adam and Eve did, so we tend also to believe the lies of Satan regarding sin. In fact, let me show you what I mean. I want you, let's go to Genesis 3 again. I know we were there a few weeks ago, but I want us to go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. I want us to just quickly look at Satan's strategy here in the garden. And so let me read the first three verses and then we'll move on from there. But Genesis 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Notice what he does. The first thing he, how he attacks this is he questioned the word of God. He planted a seed of doubt in Eve's mind, didn't he? Did God actually say... Right, so again, we see him planting that seed of doubt, questioning the word of God. And then what he does after he plants that seed, then he takes it and then he full-blown, he denies or I should say contradicts the truthfulness and the goodness of God. Let's continue reading verse 4 and following. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. See that contradiction of what God said. Verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. See that? He says, yeah, you, you can't really trust God. I mean, God, God just is trying to hold you back. He wants to keep you from knowing how good life will be if you eat of that fruit. But the thing of it is, if you notice, if you look in this passage, Satan, even though he contradicted the goodness and the truthfulness of God, he did not tell a complete lie. He Weaved, he wove a little bit of truth into that to make it more acceptable and more believable. Because he said there that, yeah, if you eat of that, um, 
he said that your eyes will be opened there in verse 5. Look at verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Their eyes were opened. He didn't completely lie, but their eyes were not opened in a good way. Their eyes were open to shame. Their eyes were open to fear. Things that they had never felt, things that they had never known, and even the idea there of knowing good and evil, they had only known good. That's the, it had been the perfect paradise for them in the garden until this moment. But when they chose to sin, all of a sudden, they did know evil. And so again, Satan did not completely lie. He mixes in truth, and so it becomes a little bit more deceptive. And you see, that is the danger of sin, and that is something you and I must guard against. That is why God makes such a big deal over our sin, because sin is the great deceiver. It blinds us to the reality that God's way is always the best way. We're going to talk more about that next week. I pray, I hope so much that you're not turned off that I told you we're going to preach on sin again next week. Because we're going to look at the fact of God's way being the best way. But sin blinds us to that. It blinds us to the reality of God's goodness and it blinds us to the reality of the deceitfulness of sin itself. Why is sin so tempting? Because it just looks good. She looked at the fruit. It looked great. And so her eyes were open, just as Satan said. We see sin before us, and we think, man, that just looks pretty good. The thing about it is I'm pretty sure, okay, I can sin here, but I can stop anytime I want. And see, that's part of the deception of sin. We need to see sin as it really is. And here is the truth about sin. Sin will never give you all that you hope it will. It never will. Sin will never fulfill you in the way that it says it will. Sin will never give you all that it promises it will. Oh, it's just going to give you some satisfaction, some pleasure. It's going to be fun. It's going to be enjoyable. Never. It will never fulfill what it promises. It will never give you all that you that it promises it will. It will never give you all that you hope it will. Never. It's, it's a great deceiver. Sin will always take you deeper into bondage than you ever thought it would. Always. I could give you illustration after illustration of people who dabbled with sin, who kind of just stuck their toe in a little bit. They weren't going to jump into the deep end. And the next thing they know, they are drowning. And you and I are vulnerable to sin if we refuse to see the truthfulness of it. It will always take you deeper into bondage than you ever thought it would. And sin will always drive you farther away from God than you ever intended. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and I praise God for that. I don't want to demean that or belittle that in any way, shape, or form. But the reality is, because we are saved, we think we can sin, and it's okay. You see, I want to be clear on this. Sin does not mean that God will turn his back on you. But it always means that you are turning away from him. Here is God, the standard of holiness. And when you and I choose to sin, or when we choose, even when we think, wow, I didn't really choose it. Yeah, we really did. Even when it happens by accident, it was still a choice on our part. But when we do that, we are, we are turning away from God. How can, it, how can sin not turn us away from God? <laughs> think about it. Sin is contrary to everything that God is. So you cannot have it both ways. You cannot embrace sin and think, oh, I'm, I'm okay with this. It's just, that's, everybody's doing it. You don't understand. Well, man, you know, I'm not going to live like some prudish way that people did back in the 1950s. This is America. This is now. <sighs> You cannot embrace sin and be close 
to God. And I know that sounds harsh, but I believe it. I think it is true. You cannot be in a close, growing, loving relationship with God and still embracing sin. If you are holding on to sin, now we still sin. We will all still sin until the day that we go to glory. But do you understand when we embrace it and we hold on to it and we refuse to repent of it, do you understand that we are turning away from God? We are turning away from God. It is impossible to be in a growing, loving relationship with God and holding on to sin. Now, see, I'm, I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm not talking about whether you can lose your salvation. We will talk more about that in a few weeks when we get into salvation. What I am talking about is your spiritual growth and your maturity. You cannot love and embrace sin and be a growing Christian cannot and if you think otherwise then you are indeed believing the lies of sin and you are only fooling yourself I can't say this strongly enough God hates sin our loving father our creator God hates sin it is contrary to everything that he is so when you and I, pre when we cling to sin and we hold on to it and we embrace it and I would say we love it, we cannot be close relationally. I'm not saying you're not saved. Don't, don't misquote me. What I'm saying is you cannot be in a growing, loving relationship with your Heavenly Father if you are refusing to repent and turn from sin. God does not give you the option because he is holy and just and righteous. Sin is everything that God is not. I pray that we will all, don't, don't, don't rationalize, don't justify, don't, don't use emotions right now. I pray that we will all just simply let scripture speak to us and see sin as it really is. I pray that we will see sin the way that God sees it. Contrary completely contrary to our loving Heavenly Father. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, please help us to hate sin in the way that you do. Help us to see sin for what it really is. Oh Father, it is the great deceiver and it never, never, never works for our good. Help us, oh Father, help us to reject the lies of sin. Help us to hold fast to your truth and to your love and your goodness. Help us to understand that your rules are not meant to make our lives miserable, but God, they are meant to enrich our lives. They are meant for our good. That's how good you are. Please, God, help us see that clearly. Help us to hate sin. And Father, for anyone here who may never have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you would help them to understand the seriousness of sin.